They were very popular with kids. Coming up on Frontiers, efforts to preserve Senator Ted Stevens' legacy. He didn't really see himself as the Hulk, but that persona kind of took on a life of its own. A mix of brawn and brains that records stored here at the Stevens Foundation may someday help us appreciate. This is one of the Anxa boxes. The foundation has also collected stories about Stevens' role in the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. I think the biggest problem was uh, the um, land loss issue. Just ahead, what these stories tell us about an important crossroads in Alaska history. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by your local Alaska Toyota dealers. Toyota, let's go places. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program. Many still think of Alaska as a frontier state, perhaps because the journey to statehood is still fresh in our collective memories. The late Senator Ted Stevens was a big part of that, and his records now stored at the Ted Stevens Foundation in Anchorage also tells Alaska's story. I'm not sure what this box is. This one has military information in there, ANCS information, BIA schools, Alaska Railroad. The alphabet soup of Alaska acronyms. There are boxes and boxes. How many years worth of paperwork do you think is here? So it's at least 40 years. In all, about 4,900 boxes, most of them filled with documents from Senator Ted Stevens' time in office. As we're going through all of these papers, we are learning something about the history of Alaska. You'll even find some of Karina Waller's boxes from her years as an aide to the senator. Her job now, to set the stage for historians who have yet to dig through this material, which contains records of Alaska's most formative years. So here's our conference space. You'll find pens here, used to sign key pieces of legislation. So this is the pen that was used to sign the Statehood Act admitting Alaska into the Union. Here's the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Authorization Act. Richard Nixon signed that. And here's the pen that was used to sign the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. ANCSA, the land deal which allowed the pipeline to go forward. For the next five minutes, Governor Hammond, Congressman Young, and I will discuss legislation of critical importance to Alaska. As our memories fade, of the man Alaskans came to call Uncle Ted, these records become increasingly important. There's a sense of urgency over some of this because um, the media used to play some of this is going extinct. Tapes, footage, and photos that will give us the backstory of events that have perhaps yet to come to light. This is one of the ANCSA boxes. Elsie Ekman is the Stevens Foundation's main archivist. These are records from the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act and land legislation that followed. The stamp date is 1989. One of her discoveries, a personal connection to a photo of Ted Stevens and a group of Alaska Native leaders. My uncle Robert Newland was the chairman of the board of the Nana Regional Corporation. Ekman says there are materials here that are not only of importance to Alaskans, but of national significance. Here, Stevens is having lunch with President-elect Ronald Reagan, the start of a close relationship. Proposals for bill implementation. Ekman recently Alaska found some handwritten notes. Stevens was in a meeting, I believe, in 1981 with President Reagan, and it was um, about the hostages, the Iran hostages. So that was very interesting. The foundation also has books, part of Stevens' personal library, all 5,000 of them. Books were really an important part of the senator's life. 
sometimes to the consternation of the staff when at three o'clock in the morning you got an email from them saying, oh, I just read this. I'm going to bring it in for you tomorrow. Many of these books are about science and history. Others promote ideas Stevens strongly opposed. And that's the thing about Senator Stevens. He liked to see different viewpoints. Maybe not something you'd expect from a man who cultivated the image of uncontrolled rage. He tended to use the Hulk as a joke. He didn't really see himself as the Hulk, but that persona kind of took on a life of its own. Oh, she's wearing a parka. Wow. She is wearing a parka. Ted Stevens' second wife, Catherine, who understood his great love for his family and later in life for his grandkids. The senator traveled a lot, but on a trip to the Middle East managed to stay in touch. When he took this trip to the Mideast, um, his granddaughter Sally had asked him to take a flat Stanley with him. And this is a handwritten letter to his granddaughter Sally. And it's just so sweet the way he describes everything. And there's flat Stanley posed with dignitaries he met along the way. This is French President Jacques Chirac. And this from just one box. One story out of many about a man hailed as one of the founding fathers of Alaska statehood. Someday, the Ted Stevens Foundation hopes to raise enough money to open a library or a museum so the public can view the historical documents and see other Ted Stevens memorabilia. Up next, Ted Stevens' role in the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act is the subject of an upcoming program. Karina Waller with the Ted Stevens Foundation and Perry Eaton are here to talk more about his legacy. To know a senator in Alaska is probably much more of a personal experience than it is in most states. Senator Ted Stevens traveled often to rural communities and became the explainer in chief of Alaska to Washington, D.C. He also had a genius for bringing money to Alaska, which he argued was because Alaska was a developing state and needed it. And he was in many ways a one-man economic machine. But his legacy goes beyond winning federal dollars for Alaska and joining us now to talk about that, Karina Waller, head of the Ted Stevens Foundation, and Perry Eaton, who is known as a native leader, a mask maker, and a businessman. <laughs> Many hats you wear, hard to sum you up. But maybe we should start off by talking about your personal relationship with Ted Stevens. Well, I started working for the senator as a high school intern, and it changed the trajectory of my life. I fell in love with Washington, D.C. and public policy. I went to law school, and thankfully, Senator Stevens hired me back. So I and didn't... were you feeling very lucky to work for a, a senator of his caliber? I was feeling very blessed at the time. And Senator Stevens became a very important mentor to me and to the numerous Alaskans who worked in his office. Um, I had the ability to travel around the state with him and fully understand uh, all of Alaska, not just the urban part. I grew up in Anchorage, so traveling to Bethel and Kivalina and Kaktovik, those kind of places really informed my love for the state, both rural and urban. Well, Perry, as a Native leader, I'm sure that you dealt with Senator Stevens on a lot of Alaska Native issues, but what was your relationship with him? We were, I, I would describe us as personal friends. And I'd met uh, the senator in 1972 at, at his birthday party at the Captain Cook, and I had the honor of sitting next to him, a 26-year-old kid sitting next to a U.S. <laughs> senator. I was obviously uh, very impressed. But I'd worked extensively with him on economic development uh, in rural Alaska when I was the uh, president and CEO of a, a community enterprise uh, the corporate community enterprise development corporation. I have to get that right. It's the village acronyms. initiatives today, right? CEDC for those of you. And you're also father of the Alaska Native Heritage Center. A couple of other hats you wear. <laughs> I had worked with uh, Roy Hundorf, who who really uh, had uh, caused the idea to gel, and uh, I'd been the first president and CEO and brought it online, working with him on funding, working with T Ted on funding. And now Roy Hundorf was one of the early um, Native CEOs in the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and maybe one of the things that we should talk about is some of the foundation's recent work and collecting oral histories on this act, which settled land claims that enabled the Alaska pipeline to go forward. Right. 
So the foundation was formed in 2001 as a means to preserve the senator's legacy. And part of that is archiving, curating the collection. And as we've been going through, um, we've been focusing on ANCSA. Um, just because it's the 45th year anniversary this Coming year. Coming up December 18th. Coming up December 18th. And we found some fascinating information in there. But what we wanted to do was, in addition to the papers that the sender had, we wanted to hear the personal stories of the people who were intimately involved in the passage of ANCSA. And so we held an oral history roundtable discussion with some of those native leaders, not all of them. And it was a fascinating opportunity for me and as an Alaskan to hear firsthand what went into this historic act. So we have a little bit of a preview for you, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of this footage. Alaska was starving uh, financially in the early days of statehood. In fact, in my mind, it was like a failing state. The voice in those rooms was about native lands for future generations. It was that fundamental and that simple. There hadn't been a settlement, we'd still be litigating today, but it was a perfect example of what the native leadership took over that issue, and they solved it. If it had been left to the lawyers, it would not be solved today. Let's, Perry, have you shed some light on why ANCSA is so pivotal to Alaska's history? Because you know, a lot of uh, general uh, public may think, well, ANCSA has to do with natives, not a me. Actually, it's a very, very complex issue uh, in the American uh, historic context. Uh, it's a major deviation from a congressional norm in settling with indigenous people on land claims. And it really goes back to the Treaty of Session in 1867. And, and it moves forward, and, and the United States had a number of opportunities to settle this issue. And it was always sort of put away and put off. The indigenous people of Alaska are the only people in their original village sites with no Indian removal. And, and were unique in that context. And when statehood came in, it was recognized that there would be a settlement at some point in the future. So in, in your view, how, how did Senator Ted Stevens figure into this? Ah, uh, I absolutely believe he was one of the most visionary players in the process. It, he was critical to the moment, uh, and timing was everything in this case. It was the right legislature, it was the right time in American history, there was a lot going on, uh, there was actually a effort to be fair and equitable in some sense, and a recognition that the old treatment of indigenous people was not a great page in American well, history. Well, you had a lot of bright young lights uh, pushing it at, at Ted Stevens to, to do things, but what did he add to this mix? He understood that it went beyond an indigenous settlement. It was really about the sort of law. A, and it was a hundred year vision on his part. What would the land ownership pattern look like in Alaska? And Alaska was really a federal reserve. It really was. BLM was a land owner. And, and, and you know, the Bureau of Land uh, Management. And, and Ted understood that it needed to be resolved. And we were in a moment when there was an indigenous claim, there was the environmental movement moving forward, D2 was a section of the act that came forward. Ted understood it in the broadest context of any player there. Well, one of the things about the foundation is, of course, it's got all of these papers now held at a private location because they're still the private property of the Stevens family. But you just can't imagine that someday people will want to go through that to settle ongoing issues with ANCSA. Well, we see the papers as actually an important resource to help current and future leaders. And so we are actively working to manage the collection so we can allow that to happen so that looking at things like ANCSA can help inform decision makers for the issues we have today. And that was one of the things that Senator Stevens was so good at. He brought in diverse groups to help develop innovative solutions to difficult Alaskan issues. Now, one of the things that I imagine we will see happen in, in coming years is 
tribal interests mm -hmm. feeling that ANGSA wasn't the best deal for them, they want to reopen it, maybe uh, reopen ANILCA. Harry, do you, do you foresee that these documents are going to be important in that? Absolutely, and I, I don't think it's as much a quote a reopening and redoing as it is a natural progression. Um, the concept of private ownership, fee simple title, the nature of fee simple title is trade. Natives view our ownership of the land much more as a custodian. Now, that's a tribal issue, and if you have this land that can move, some of that land needs to be reserved for the tribe or for the identity, the cultural identity. And I see it as an evolution. I think all bills in Congress are, are we're very flexible as a nation. And I, I, I see an evolution where we're going to we're going to end up with both. Well, one of the things about this collection now is it's private and, and it isn't open to the public. What's going on with it right now? Well, as, as you know, uh, Senator Stevens had a lot of constituents who routinely wrote into our office for assistance. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do as we go through and archive the papers is identify those private letters and memos um, and they have social keep, security numbers. They have social yeah. security numbers. It could be VA benefits. It could be people asking Senator Stevens for personal advice. Um, so we want to make sure that those things remain private. And so that's a lot of our job right now is identifying what is contained in the collection and making sure that those things that are to remain private remain private. Now, historians will probably, you know, 20, 30, 40 years look back on the end of a Stevens career when there was uh, the corruption trials, which eventually uh, were thrown out, the verdict uh, due to prosecutorial misconduct. I mean, how will the foundation handle that part of his story? Well, the foundation right now does not currently have the documents. We have the documents from his 40-year career. But if individuals are interested in knowing more about um, the case, Senator Stevens' lawyer wrote a book, Rob Carey, it's called Unjust Prosecution, uh, not guilty, the unjust pro unlawful prosecution of Senator Ted Stevens. So if they want more information, they can refer to that. So in wrapping things up here, you know, a lot of people have said that a, a lot of Ted Stevens' story is Alaska's story, at least in terms of st the statehood story. Thoughts on that? Ted was a perfect immigrant. If you were going to go out and recruit Alaskans, to bring forward, uh, I mean, he would have ended up on the top of the list. He was a visionary, he had passion, uh, but he was also pragmatic. He was focused. Uh, I, I have the highest regard for the man. Well, I think Alaska is a state of pioneers and innovators, and I think you can look throughout Senator Stevens' career and you can see he was a pioneer and an innovator. And of course, a, a person who kind of created these engines that would keep on rolling. Oh. <laughs> I, I think that's one of the undersung pieces of the senator. He was a visionary, always. Even, even in the most mundane in of details. In the most mundane of details, you're absolutely right. It was always a hundred years. One of his counsel to the staff was always, we can't just look at the next year, next five years. We need everything that we do should be for our kids and grandkids. So we should look beyond our current status to the future. And that is a very welcome kind of thought. We hope that maybe other politicians <laughs> might emulate. So I want to thank you both very much for being with us, Karina Waller and Perry Eaton. Well, still ahead, we turn our attention to another legacy, the Alaska Federation of Natives. It's kind of a miracle that we got a settlement. Before ANCSA, there was a movement to settle land claims, a movement that is still a work in progress. It is a year of anniversaries. The Alaska Federation of Natives recently celebrated its 50th convention in Fairbanks in October. But back when it started, AFN was more or less a voice in the wilderness. Today, it is the dominant political, economic, and cultural voice for natives across our state. Native corporations and their impressive office buildings, they loom large in the state's economic landscape. 
Yet most Alaskans have no idea how these corporations came to be, how they owe their existence to AFN's grassroots fight for land. At the museum, you can find a tribute to AFN's humble beginnings. Oh my God, that is a copy of my paper. A copy of a graduate research paper Willie Hensley wrote for Justice J. Rabinowitz. Hensley still has the original. And it has the A that he gave me for the paper. A paper that laid out AFN's legal case that Alaska Natives were entitled to land taken away at statehood. These are like founding documents here. You can also find Emil Nadi's report on AFN's first meeting. He was president. Editorials opposed us, mining groups opposed us, individuals wrote letters against us. People thought we were militants or radicals. Maybe not radicals, but young guns ready to do what they felt needed to be done. This was a, a actual crisis point. This is seven years after statehood. The, the machine was in motion, that is the land selection machine. Lands for thousands of years held in common by people who depended on food from the wild to survive. We were never going to get that land back, ever. And so it was pretty darn clear to us that we had to stop the state selections. Our first reaction, of course, was to basically state that we owned all of Alaska. We wanted it back, we wanted to be paid for the land that was already taken. Naturally, this was impossible. But the forces of history worked in AFN's favor. In the backdrop of the land claims fight, there were marches through the streets of towns and cities. A national civil rights and anti poverty movement, which gave Alaska natives momentum. A sympathetic president, Richard Nixon, never forgot his college football coach, a Native American who helped him understand the injustices to his people. And then the push for the Trans Alaska Pipeline. To build it, oil companies wanted land claims settled and probably one of the most important factors, a newfound unity. We wrote letters across the state to people we didn't know, people whose names we just heard. People brought together under the umbrella of AFN. Even then, as a young man, Emil Nadi recognized the potential. And to think what's happened here, the friendships we've, we've made and the people we've come to know from coming together, I think is one of the great happenings. It's kind of a miracle that we got a settlement. We had no money and no organization. And no communication system. And no phones to the villages. Ladies and gentlemen of the AFN, this is the White House in Washington calling. I present the President of the United States. The year 1971, President Richard Nixon addresses AFN in this recorded message. I want you to be among the first to know that I have just signed the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. This is a milestone in Alaska's history, and in the way our government deals with Native and Indian people. The deal, 44 million acres of land and nearly a billion dollars. The legacy of AFN, a story that's far from over. Alaska history is always a frontier. As time passes, there are always new discoveries and insights. We want to thank the Alaska Federation of Natives and the Alaska Moving Image Preservation Association for sharing their archival footage with us. And thank you for being a part of this week's conversation.